So I will now ask our speakers in our, on our panel to um, turn on their video and microphone and I will introduce them to you. So let's start with Ayan Kosi. Ayan is Chief Economist at, and Director of Prospects Group in the Equitable Growth, Finance and Institutions Practice Group of the World Bank. Prior to joining the World Bank, he was Assistant Director of the Research Department and Deputy Chief of the multi, Multilateral Surveillance Division in the IMF. Ayan is a non-resident senior fellow at the Brookings Institution, research fellow at the Center for Economic Policy Research, and a research associate at the Center for Applied Macroeconomics here at the ANU. Catherine Mann is an international economist whose career has spanned across domestic policy in the USA and global analysis at international organizations, research and the private sector. Most recently, Catherine was the global chief economist at uh, Citibank Bank from February 2018 to May 2021. Prior to that, she was chief economist and G20 finance deputy at the OECD from October 2014 to November 2017. She has also held positions at Brandeis University, the Federal Reserve Board of the Governors, the White House and the World Bank, among others. She, she was recently appointed as an external member of the Monetary Policy Committee at the Bank of England. Adam McKissack is the Chief Economist at the Business Council of Australia. Adam has responsibility for leading economic policy and analysis work within the Business Council. In this role, he works closely with Australia's leading chief executives and representatives from their companies to shape public policy and promote economic growth. He was formerly a senior executive in the Australian Treasury and has a breadth of experience advising governments on economic policy issues. He has held various positions um, including in the Treasury and other government agencies covering areas such as preparation of the federal budget, macroeconomic forecasting, international finance, tax, structural reform and foreign international investment policy. And finally, Yang Yao is a liberal arts chair professor at the China Center for Economic Research and the National School of Development at Peking University. He currently serves as the director of China Center for Economic Research and Dean of the National School of Development and editor of the China Center for Economic Research House Journal called China Economic Quarterly. He serves as the chairman of China Economic Annual Meetings and chairman of the Federal Foundation of Modern Economics. His research interests include economic transition and development in China. And he's also a prolific writer for magazines and newspapers, including the Financial Times and Project Syndicate. Okay, so now let's um, start our panel. Let me start with you, Catherine. So we had you as a similar um, in a similar session last year. And when we last spoke, the unemployment rate figure for the US in April 2020 reached 14.7% and 6.65 million people had filed for unemployment. The current US unemployment rate is 6.3%. So last year's um, Atlanta Fed GDP now figure suggested output growth of minus 48.5% on an annualized basis. And that measure is currently a positive 5.1%. And the World Bank has shown that the economy's growth rate globally is the fastest it's ever been coming out of a recession. So that's quite an economic turnaround. But the angst of the economists about the robustness of the recovery is plain to see every time we get a, a single piece of data. Do you think that the recovery in the US in some parts of the globe is as fragile as some economists fear? Uh, well, Renee, I think that it's uh, without question, the global recovery is fragile. There's uh, myriad downside risks. I'm going to go through four of them. Uh, first, I'm going to talk about differences across economies. And of course, that's important if we think about the global economic recovery. Then I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, across sectors and the extent to which the recovery is fragile across sectors. Then we can talk about fiscal and monetary policy and the threat of consolidation and normalization. Uh, and then finally, asset valuations. So if we go through those four elements of, of potential risks, uh, it's, it's clear that the risks are on the downside. Uh, and so um, the potential for downgrades in global growth uh, next time the major international institutions uh, do their forecasts, I think the, the risks are definitely on the downside. So let's first talk about across economies. 
um, incomplete vaccinations. I mean, it's, you know, it, within advanced economies, there's incomplete vaccinations, but frankly, even more importantly, uh, incomplete vaccinations within the emerging markets. Uh, it's, it's inavailability of uh, vaccinations to deliver. It is a challenge of domestic deployment uh, for a whole host of reasons. Emerging markets are really uh, not um, able to, and, and not participating in the vaccinations that are available. Now, emerging markets on a PPP basis are more than 50% of the global economy. So if we have delays in achieving uh, vaccinations in emerging markets, this is clearly going to have an impact on their capacity to be part of the global recovery. And it does represent downside risk overall. Um, of course, emerging markets play an incredibly important role in global supply chains. Uh, and this is, and we are seeing the, the uh, fragility of those global supply chains uh, as they are uh, uh, you know, uh, as various ports, as various facilities are closed down on account of the, uh, the vaccination challenges in, in many countries. We see this in the very soft PMIs in many um, of the emerging market economies. Uh, for those who are not part of the supply chain directly with on the manufacturing side, of course, they have very important tourism linkages to the global economy. And with incomplete vaccinations and, and the shutdowns and border controls, uh, you know, lost tourism is a very, uh, a uh, very important um, downside risk, continued downside risk for many of the emerging market economies. So that's that's a first set of things that, that show you clearly there's there's fragility in in the global economy's uh, recovery, notwithstanding the numbers that look good uh, when it when it was so bad. You know, numbers can look good. Um, the second issue has to do with COVID mutations um, and the impact that that is having on uh, sectoral recoveries within economies. Now, you mentioned the um, Atlanta Fed's GDP now uh, forecast. Well, about 10 days ago, it was 6.7%. Uh, then it was downgraded to 3.7%. And that was even before the most recent job numbers came out uh, that are probably going to be a little bit more concerning when we think about prospects in the United States. But more broadly, um, across all uh, advanced economies where vaccinations have been uh, more, uh, more widespread, uh, you know, we have a slow pace of, con of the uh, consumer recovery. Uh, some of it has to do with, um, you know, uh, concerns about and having precautionary savings, but also it has, uh, you know, continued challenges in um, services in terms of uh, uh, delivering services, in terms of services availability, and in terms of uh, the willingness of individuals to go out there and uh, really go back to a normal uh, strategy. So COVID mutations, in the advanced economies, significant issues continuing with regard to recovery of the services sectors. And that of course, we have to remember in advanced economies in particular, services sectors are the principal driver of GDP growth. They are the principal employer. And so even though manufacturing looks, looks much better and people are buying um, you know, goods, uh, these are smaller, smaller segments of the economy. That has implications for business investment. Maybe we can talk about that in a little while. The third point I wanted to make was with regard to the challenges um, with regard to fiscal and monetary policy, uh, either consolidation on the fiscal side, potential normalization of monetary policy. Now, of course, the underpinnings of these um, potential moves on consolidation or normalization have to do with, of course, concerns about inflation and concerns about debt, debt sustainability. So there is uh, a rumblings um, uh, in, especially in advanced economies about a return to fiscal discipline. Now is the time to do this. There has been uh, you know, advances in, in, in recovery, especially if you look at, the, at um, the manufacturing sector. And so there's this concern about debt sustainability and that now is a good time to engage in fiscal discipline, um, putting economies on a consolidation path. Now, and there's also, of course, uh, some fiscal cliffs having to do with the ending of furlough programs in some countries and the ending of um, uh, pandemic related benefits in other economies. Uh, and these fiscal cliffs, um, you know, might be beneficial from the standpoint of, of fiscal uh, top line, uh, but, you know, to the extent that these have been important supports for consumption, um, there is a concern about whether or not the rug is being pulled out uh, from under a little bit too soon. Now, of course, on monetary policy normalization, again, the concerns are when we look at some of the uh, inflation statistics, which again, coming from a very low base, 
um, we have to worry about, you know, that, that, that the misinterpretation of some of these inflation data uh, that would, you know, over time with the base effects being um, removed from the data, some of the energy, um, energy uh, head, uh, tailwinds to inflation turning into headwinds and a variety of other elements having to do with inflation. Nevertheless, um, there is uh, a move towards at least considering um, the pathway towards monetary policy normalization. Um, and uh, this of course has implications for the interest rates uh, that are uh, at this time very supportive of asset markets. So let me turn to that last piece of the puzzle, uh, the stretched asset valuations. Uh, now these asset valuations really are predicated on continued low interest rates. And so there's this interplay or an endogeneity between the um, interest rate uh, paths, the policy rate paths and potential uh, asset price uh, volatility. Now, some of those valuations, uh, particularly equity markets in the United States seem to be particularly stretched. Um, housing markets uh, in many countries uh, are at their all time, are, are at very high um, valuations. And for example, the OECD metric of, of uh, global house prices it has taken us back to where we were prior to the global financial crisis, a concern uh, that even though there have been substantial more um, macroprudential and microprudential um, uh, regulations put into place to support uh, both to, 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 to uh, reduce vulnerability in housing markets. Nevertheless, prices are very high and, and potentially a concern. Credit spreads very narrow. Um, and, uh, you know, something like Bitcoin, for example, uh, is, is another indicator of, of the uh, degree to which um, asset valuations are perhaps a little bit disconnected from, from the, the state of the uh, real side of the economy. If we have a stumble you know, in asset prices, uh, as there's a realization that maybe the real economic fund foundations of say earnings um, are not quite as uh, supportive as, as uh, the markets currently have been uh, pricing in, then of course we have wealth effects, we have business investment effects, we have some uncertainty effects, that turbulence uh, does have uh, implications for um, the global economy going forward as well. So a lot of risks out there, a lot of risks. Okay, well, well, let's turn to another part of the world. Let's turn to China. So, um, Yan, I would like to ask you. Um, so, China grew by 2.3% last year, and growth is forecast to rebound to 8.5% this year, uh, which is an upward revision of the forecast for growth um, in China from last year. So, are you more optimistic or less optimistic than Catherine on her view of the economic fragilities that we're facing? Well, actually, I'm more optimistic uh, than Catherine. Uh, uh, well, uh, in this year, China's growth uh, has uh, slowed down. Uh, you know, in many years, uh, uh, China actually lagged behind the United States in terms of uh, uh, growth rate, right? Uh, and that's going to last uh, uh, for several quarters, uh, uh, I, I think. Uh, but uh, in the medium range and the longer range, I, I think uh, China and also the world is going to have a, a brighter future than Catherine has just uh, uh, described, I think. Uh, let me uh, focus on uh, three new technologies that I believe are going to drive uh, the Chinese economy and also the world economy into a new stage of uh, uh, high growth. When I say high growth, of course, it's not that, that kind of a double digit growth. A, a reasonable and respect, uh, respectful uh, growth rates. So the first uh, uh, new technology is uh, AI. I mean, can you imagine only like a four or five years ago uh, when AlphaGo was released, uh, people were so surprised by AI technology. But today we are using AI almost uh, every minute, right? AI has become more sophisticated, uh, but also uh, much cheaper, much cheaper than before, right? Uh, so for example, in China, uh, we have a word called uh, uh, Ma Long, uh, which means uh, digital uh, workers, right? So when you go to those uh, so-called high-tech uh, companies, you see a lot of people working out there. This is so labor intensive, right? That also means uh, 
AI technology uh, have become uh, so widely used and become cheaper, right? Uh, so that's going to drive a lot of new uh, industries. Uh, probably we, we do not notice them, but they are coming into our daily life, uh, particularly after the pandemic, right? Uh, so applications uh, are booming, right? Uh, for example, in Japan, uh, uh, people were not used to use like uh, internet, uh, you know, mobile telecommunication technologies. But after pandemic, uh, Japanese people are beginning to use all sorts of uh, uh, new technologies. So this is one. The second is the solar power. Uh, this is quite related to, to the climate uh, agenda. Uh, we know that uh, uh, climate agenda has been on the table uh, for 30 years, right? But uh, over the last 30 years, most of the time, uh, we were just uh, talking, talking about climate change. Uh, but uh, over the last uh, several years, uh, the agenda is being turned into action. That's very important, right? Uh, so globally, uh, uh, industrial countries uh, are pushing for a unified uh, carbon uh, price uh, uh, globally. And European countries uh, are discussing to place uh, border tax on uh, imports, right? Uh, you know, in the short run, probably that's not going to be good for economic growth uh, uh, worldwide. But in the longer term, I think it is going to be a huge driver for solar power technology to be uh, applied worldwide, right? Uh, you know, they, they, they come to China, you can see China is the largest uh, carbon emitter uh, in the world. Uh, but among China's uh, carbon emission, uh, firepower uh, accounts for 80%. Right? That, that's a lot because China burns a lot of coal. And, and China has announced that uh, you know, by 2030, China is going to flatten is carbon emission and by uh, 2060, China is going to neutralize uh, carbon emission. And those are two daunting tasks. And China has to change its energy mix in order to achieve those two goals. Uh, but luckily, uh, China is a bigger solar power producer. Uh, China produces 75% uh, of solar uh, panel uh, components and uh, has one third of the world uh, solar power installation. Uh, so China has a huge manufacturing capacities uh, in solar power. Uh, here, I also want to raise a, a question, you know, economists uh, thought about uh, uh, government policy uh, or government support to industry. You know, solar power uh, was introduced in China 20 years ago uh, then in 2006, uh, the government began to heavily subsidize solar power industry. And by that time, most of the economists, including myself, criticized the government, saying that, no, 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 you, you should not do this. But 15 years after, we see the results, right? China has become the largest producer of solar pan panel uh, equipment and uh, the largest uh, solar power producer, right? So that's uh, the second area. The third area is uh, electrical cars, okay? Um, you know, this, this is also consistent with the climate agenda. And many countries have announced plans to phase out the petrol cars, right? Uh, China has not announced uh, a deadline to phase out the petrol cars, but in China, electrical cars are moving so fast. Uh, also, thanks to a government policy, uh, I, I think that, that was starting from 2010, the government began to subsidize elect or 2014, uh, the government began to subsidize electric cars. Uh, um, but today, China has become the largest producer of electric cars. Right? So electric uh, cars uh, uh, are much simpler than uh, petrol cars, right? Um, 
but it uses a lot of new technologies, particularly in batteries and AI. I mean, in a sense, you can think about the electric cars as a combination of batteries and AI. And uh, luckily, China uh, lead these in both uh, areas, right? Uh, you know, China's uh, battery companies uh, are leading uh, the world, and in AI area, uh, China is also one of the world leaders. Um, but not just in China, uh, US and also Europe uh, are doing the same. But probably in the coming decades, uh, China is going to produce most of the low end and the median level electric cars. Of course, China also produce a high end electric cars, but on a higher end, I think uh, Europe and the United States are going to produce most of those uh, more expensive electric cars. Right? So that's a good combination. Right? Um, people, of course, uh, worry about, uh, you know, you talk about the, all those new technologies, uh, but in the last several decades, by economists measure, the new technologies that have not contributed to economic growth because uh, probably many technologies just uh, a replacement of older technologies. So you don't see a real growth. Uh, but the, in today's world, I, I think that those new technologies are going to create a new opportunities and uh, they're going to provide extensive uh, margins uh, for economic growth, right? Uh, AI does not just uh, replace uh, like a human mind, the human hands, actually creates uh, a lot of new businesses, right? Uh, solar power, of course, most of it is going to replace firepower, but it's also going to stimulate uh, inventions of new technologies, electric cars, uh, probably are going to be the same, right? Uh, Nasdaq, let me put forward one suggestion. Uh, I think the current climate agenda, uh, at least in the short run, is not going to be friendly to uh, countries in Africa and uh, South Asia, uh, because those countries cannot jump into the solar power uh, stage. Right. So if uh, the world uh, is going to have uh, a unified carbon price and European countries uh, set up uh, uh, carbon tax uh, at the border, then those developing countries are going to be hurt. I think at this juncture, we should not uh, only talk about uh, you know, unified carbon tax or carbon price, but also uh, some concrete plan to help those countries, right? So probably the world needs a new uh, infrastructure building drive for African and the Southeastern uh, developing countries. And in that, China can contribute quite a lot. Okay, let me stop here. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, I'll, now I'll turn to Ihan. Let me first ask you your views about near-term growth prospects in 2021-2022. So the World Bank has shown in its Global Economic Prospects report that you're involved in producing that the global recovery is the fastest that it's ever been coming out of recession over the past 80 years. I want to dig a little deeper into this seemingly good news story because other evidence suggests that the pandemic has inflicted tremendous um, damage on particularly on emerging and developing countries where unemployment rates are high, investment has declined, and the education of the world's um, children has been interrupted, particularly in countries where online is not an option. Poverty has increased in the first time in a generation. So the strong global growth that we're seeing seems to me to be an artifact of the growth occurring in the world's largest economies of um, the US and China. So do you think the economic spillovers um, from the US and China to the rest of the world will be enough to support growth in low income countries? Uh, thank you, Rene. Thank you. Uh, indeed, uh, we are expecting uh, growth very high. In fact, it could be the strongest uh, post-recession pace in terms of global growth we have seen over the past 80 years. And um, the big observation is that uh, a substantial uh, 
fraction of this growth is coming from advanced economies and a few emerging market developing economies. Uh, the United States, we are expecting growth anywhere between six and a half to 6.8%. Uh, in China, uh, growth uh, is gonna probably exceed 8%. But when you look at other emerging market developing economies, we have a much more subdued growth forecast less than four and a half percent. One important point about the current global recovery, uh, it's all about those countries that have access to vaccines and those that do not have access to vaccines. And there, there is a huge difference between advanced economies uh, that are delivering record growth rates coming out of a recession and those uh, low-income countries, uh, middle-income countries that are still struggling in terms of getting the vaccines and distributing them. Uh, unless the global community addresses this problem of uh, the, the unequal distribution of vaccines, it's going to be difficult to overcome the pandemic and it's going to be uh, basically impossible to have a evenly distributed global recovery. Now, with respect to US and China, delivering strong growth and having you know, very large spillovers, of course, when you have these two economies um, having this type of growth outcomes, uh, that's, that's a reason uh, to celebrate. But unfortunately, uh, their strong growth performance will not be enough to drive a robust recovery uh, in emerging developing economies and especially low-income countries. So uh, when you look at low-income countries, most of them have the underlying structural problems. This year, uh, we are expecting in, in these economies growth to be around a bit below 3%. Uh, and that's you know a decade-long uh, lowest growth rate in these economies. Now, uh, per capita growth numbers will be essentially zero in this year in low-income countries. About two-thirds of them are affected by fragility, conflict, and violence. So when you focus on those countries, the outlook in these fragile and complex states is particularly dire. Now, uh, when you look at the vaccination numbers, uh, things look really uh, very, very disappointing. Less than 2% of the population in low-income countries has received at least one dose of vaccine as of late August. Just one twentieth of the share of the population vaccinated in the world. Uh, so um, really, this is something uh, global community, as I mentioned, needs to pay attention to. So what happened with the pandemic there were existing vulnerabilities, and now these vulnerabilities, uh, in a sense, were magnified, such as fragility, extreme poverty, weak administrative capacity, elevated debt levels, disasters, of course, uh, be becoming more frequent because of the climate change. And all of them together make the, you know, the, these economies less resilient. And, and having basically accumulating problems and, and the, we are seeing the compounded effects of those problems. In many of these economies, another big issue is the elevated debt levels. And a uh, global community try to address this problem, setting up the, of course, debt suspension initiative. Uh, that initiative is going to expire at the end of the year. There is now a common framework to basically restructure the debt of some of these economies and some countries already have been going through this uh, process. So all in all, uh, there's a global recovery underway, highly uneven. How this global recovery is going to proceed is gonna depend on, on the health front, whether we can get ahead of the pandemic, and of course, how the policymakers uh, is going to set up their policies uh, as we basically start this uh, post-pandemic recovery. But let me stop here. Thank you.
Okay, let me now turn to Adam. We'll ask some questions about Australia. So apart from the short recession that Australia experienced last year, Australia has had a remarkable run of positive growth since 1991, um, including positive growth in the most recent quarter. Despite this sustained positive growth, you are the author of a recent Business Council discussion paper called Living on Borrowed Time, Australia's Economic Future. The title of the report doesn't have a positive tone to it. So why did the Business Council write this report? Thanks, Renee. And I think certainly the report is written against the backdrop that we have done well. Um, we've done very well in the last uh, few decades. And we have a lot of potential, but we can do better is, is the key message of living on borrowed time. We've actually had now five intergenerational reports over the last 20 years. They've all sort of told us that if we don't sort of do something about our productivity performance, growth and living standards will slow in Australia. And it's actually what we're seeing, it's, it's coming through quite clearly in the data already. Um, so we've been out talking to the community about, about uh, the issues we've got on the paper. People are really surprised to learn that the last decade was our worst decade for growth and living standards in 60 years. So I think we have this sort of creeping issues uh, coming through in the Australian economy that, that people aren't really seeing. Um, I, and I think, you know, there are, Thinking about the sort of issues the panelists have raised so far, there are some big forces of change coming our way that are really going to sort of accentuate uh, a lot of the sort of underlying issues we're facing in the Australian economy. Obviously, with the start, our starting point now is a very different fiscal position. So we now have the highest uh, government debt since the Second World War. So that changes the whole, the whole fiscal picture for Australia. Uh, the global picture, as we have just heard, is very, very different. Um, there's a lot more instability, uh, both economic and I think geopolitical, um, but at the same time, a lot of opportunity for Australia. So we need to think about where we sit in the world. Um, we're seeing technological change accelerate through the COVID period, as, as uh, Yang Yao talked about earlier. And sort of how do we sit in that sort of changing uh, te technological uh, world and you know, what does that mean for our business models, et cetera. Uh, and obviously the last one is the sort of the climate change uh, challenge. So most of our major trading partners now are committing uh, to net zero by mid-century. So, so how do we respond to that? So I think there's a lot of forces that are bringing some of these longer term issues to a head. And as we sort of look to the recovery from COVID phase, we, we sort of need to think about how, that, how it's going to impact. So what, what we've sort of done in this paper, and we've sort of gone out to the community across Australia, we're talking to people right across the country, and we, we're sort of not giving them a menu of here's what you have to do. We talk about six big shifts we need to think about in this country as we sort of look at the sort of COVID recovery uh, challenge. The first of these is really about sort of how we transform our industry structure. How do we ensure we have a, a diverse and resilient industrial base? So we're very good at a few things in Australia, but uh, as we see with these forces of change, I think the types of things we invest in now uh, won't give us wealth in the future. So we're, you know, we're good at mining and agriculture, but how do we sort of put, put a few more eggs in our industrial basket? Um, the second one is really just having a more proactive uh, response to climate change, uh, having some national goals and actually taking opportunity. So Australia could actually uh, be a leader in clean energy. So how do we actually turn this challenge of climate change uh, into an opportunity uh, for Australia, which we know is there? Um, I think you know, an additional one is, is our skills and education system. So how do we lift our international competitiveness? So one is really about, we've seen a, something of a decline in our performance and education standards here in Australia. How do we lift that up and become more competitive? Uh, we have a challenge around the fiscal, uh, as I mentioned. So how is our, you know, do we have a tax system that is gonna deliver us uh, sustainable revenues will help pay down debt as well as deliver uh, the services needed of an aging population. So there's a whole question around that, and that needs to be a sort of a, a discussion across the federation. It's not just a Commonwealth government issue, it's also a, a state government issue. And I think the openness issue is very important too. So where does, where does Australia want to sit in the world uh, moving forward? And obviously, we in the past generated a lot of our wealth uh, from our connections to the global economy. Uh, as a small open economy, that is the best place for us to be. So, but where do we sort of position ourselves and take advantage of some of the opportunities coming uh, through the ongoing growth in Asia and so on? 
And I think the last shift we talk about is really just making sure that the growth is even across the, the economy and that we're sort of addressing areas of uh, entrenched disadvantage. Uh, people aren't held back by gender. Uh, they're not held back by where they live in Australia. So sort of picking up that regional agenda. So it's, it's a sort of fairly ambitious uh, conversation we're trying to have with the country currently. Um, but we're trying to retest, you know, what is, what is the sort of appetite for change and how does, how does the country want to respond uh, across those six uh, big areas? I think they're all things we can maybe delve into a bit more, but I'll, I'll sort of leave it there as a summary. Great, thank you. So I'll just remind the audience that um, the Q&A will start soon. So if you'd like to um, um, put your uh, questions in the Q&A box. Um, in the meantime, I've got many questions to go through. So um, I'll now turn back to Catherine. Um, other notable pandemic trends with consequences for economic renewal are the behaviour of savings and investment in the economy. So some classes of consumers have amassed huge savings through the pandemic. The savings of Americans are roughly $1 trillion more than what they were a year ago. And we have significant infrastructure investment stimulus programs in place. So what do we need to do to incentivize businesses to invest and consumers to spend in a way that leads to sustained economic renewal? So thanks, Renee. Um, this is a challenge. Um, it's a challenge uh, on the consumer side. I think we have to recognize that the distribution of savings, in other words, the people who have been able to work from home, continued on with their, with their earnings, uh, but yet have not had, been able to spend on the things that they usually spend on restaurants, entertainment, travel. Um, that's not the whole population. Um, and in fact, those are the people with the, with the, shall we say, lowest marginal propensity to consume. So um, how that savings gets deployed uh, is I think an important question going forward. It could be a source of uh, continued robust uh, growth in, uh, on the consumer side uh, that would be supportive as, um, as the fiscal policy gets, uh, gets re goes into retreat. But I think, we, I think we don't know that. I, don't, I think we don't know that it is very dependent on, on the COVID and mutations and the availability, for example, of, of cross-border travel. Um, I think we have to remember um, that for those who have not been in a position of having excess savings or you know, uh, more savings because they haven't been able to go out and spend it, the people who, who spend all of their earnings, they will be going back to employment but is it employment that actually represents a, a supportive uh, consumer demand? You know, the, some of these jobs are not as, uh, don't pay as much as uh, a living wage. Um, although there have been some changes at the very low end in terms of um, higher wage uh, uh, bonuses and so forth for taking a job. But nevertheless, I think we, I think we have to be very, uh, we have to be concerned about the support for consumption going forward because of the extent to which uh, US fiscal policy in particular was designed to have a very, very large uh, consumer uh, boost to it. And that of course is, is being sort of taken off the table with regard uh, with, as, as pandemic uh, benefits roll off. On the investment side, you know, I I'm going to join uh, with uh, uh, Yao and, and with Ian talking about the role of climate in terms of um, the, the key incentive for business investment. Yes, we have business investment in information technology in order to deal with all of the changes in structure having to do with the pandemic. Yes, we have business investment having to do with uh, supply chain reorientation uh, to you know, make production in more locations. Uh, this is going to have some investment associated with it. But if we really want to have something durable and large with, and consistent with, uh, with regard to business investment, we really do have to be talking about a, uh, a durable and global commitment to a change in the relative price of carbon. Uh, whether we do that directly through a carbon tax within a market cap and trade, or whether we do that with regard to a border tax adjustment, whether we do that with regard to um, taking away a lot of subsidies that exist for fossil fuels, because there, there are a lot that are there, um, you know, whether we do that with regard to um, carbon regulations, whether we do that through, for example, the total climate finance disclosure um, that central banks and regulators have put onto the, finance, the private financial system to disclose uh, what is uh, in the, um, the, the carbon intensity of their portfolios and therefore sort of incentivize carbon, understanding carbon intensity at the firm level um, uh, that would create this incentive for having um, a lower uh, 
uh, carbon, uh, uh, lower carbon intensity. All of that is necessary in order to create incentives for the private sector and the private financial sector to move forward with a change in business investment that's necessary to, to reach these carbon goals. The challenge, I mean, that's a big challenge to be with, right? But an even, uh, an even bigger challenge, and, and it's something that, that Yao um, did not really address, which is it's one thing to innovate, it's another thing to adopt. Um, you can have lots of innovation in climate space or in, in some of these other spaces, but the, the, the record of adoption is something that we can look through IT itself back in the 1990s. Um, there are firms in every sector that are the innovators and are the adopters of existing innovations. But then there are a lot of firms, a very, very big tail of firms that do not adopt innovations that are available, they are off the shelf, they don't adopt them. Um, it could be because they're too expensive, it could be because you know, the head manager doesn't wanna do it. Um, but these are critical questions for um, business investment more broadly to have the type of beneficial uh, change that will be supportive of potential output, productivity growth uh, going forward. So I just like to thank all of our panelists today for their really fantastic insights. Um, it's been a great way to start the conference. I still have two pages of questions that I didn't get to ask, so there's still a lot of ground to be covered. So everyone at home, please join me in thanking Catherine, Ihan, Young, and Adam for their wonderful presentation. And if you clap at home, we can't hear you, but it means that you'll have really good karma for the rest of the day at the conference. So thank you very much.